Today I'm going to talk you through a project that anybody can make and sell and can put the money towards buying the next tool on their wish list. Win, win, win. What makes this project so beginner friendly is that we're using this. This is planed square edge timber, so it's already been prepped for you. So when you glue it together up into boards, you don't have to worry about milling it down first. And it's fairly inexpensive because it's pine. It's 44 mil in width, 12 mil in depth, and it comes in 2,400 mil, give or take lengths. And you can buy it from some of the bigger stores over here in the UK. As we go along, I'm also gonna give you dimensions for what I'm cutting. In truth, you can make it up as you go along if you want to. What we're actually going to make is a lovely jewelry box with some little features and a lovely interior. It's really easy. It's not beyond anybody's skill level who's watching, trust me. And I'm gonna show you all of the little tips and tricks along the way, like getting your hinges perfectly lined up so that the sides are flush, because that is one of the hardest things I've found to do. The one thing that is great about these boxes is we can batch them out. In fact, on this video, I'm gonna make six at the same time, all of which with a slight tweak to the design. So stick around and see different ways that you can add your personal touches to them. First thing we've got to do though, is use this crosscut station and get all of this wood ripped down into the boards. As I go through it, I'll tell you what lengths I've done. That was a super easy batch cut. This is everything you need to do the outside of the box. You've got the tops, you've got the sides, and then you've got the short ends. All really easy. Next thing we're gonna do is glue up three of the 350 mil pieces together. Don't have plain edge timber. All you need to do for each of the joints is open it like a book, clamp it together, plane it, close it again, and you'll get a really tight edge. So let's get it glued up. That was frantic, but it'll get the job done. Okay. These are come out of clamps now. If you've got a thicknesser, send them on through. You can do it with a sander. I'm just gonna quickly plane them all down, mainly because I quite like planing pine. Don't take too much off, because they're already quite thin. And then we're gonna cut the sides and get it all glued together. I confess, I did not try and get finished with the plane on these. I just used it to level them out. It wasn't sharp enough really to get a crisp finish. So now I'm gonna sand them. All you're doing is getting to the insides because you can't get to them later. And then we're gonna pick what we're gonna use for each piece. The next bit we're gonna build is the surround of the box. To save a bit of cutting later, I've just cut these to be about four to five mil shorter than the ones we used for the tops and the base. The reason for that is it just means that the tops, if you haven't got the ends perfectly aligned, that means we've got some trimming space and it's gonna be as close to the length of the finished box as you're gonna get. What is important is that for the sides and for the shorter end pieces, they are paired off with as close as you can get to being identical partners. I used a stop block on my crosscut station and instead of butting these together, we're gonna to route in a rebate into the ends of the longer pieces that the short piece is gonna sit in. And once we've done that, we can glue them up. I'm hoping that the router table is actually gonna make my life a little bit easier here. The next thing we're gonna do is check two pieces together, check that the two rebate lines are accurate. Once you've done that, it's dry fit time. After the dry fit, glue fit time. And after that, add the top and bottom and we're nearly there. 
And this is why we do a dry fit. Check your tops against the bottom as well because mine, I've got a little bit of the side sticking out by about two to three mil. If you get that, Really simple, all you gotta do is take these inner pieces and just skim off the distance that's different. Don't worry, these things happen in a build. I'm not gonna hide my mistakes, that is just me measuring wrong. Probably adding up wrong as well. Once you're confident that the glue has gone off enough on these, the next thing we can do is take the clamps off carefully and put the lids on. Now, if you're worried about the lids denting in the bottom because it's pine, it's quite soft, maybe put another piece of wood between the pine top and the clamps. Starting to look a little bit like a box. Now, don't worry if it's still a little bit messy. Everything we're gonna do now is to clean it up and to get it looking really good. Like anything in woodworking, there are multiple ways of doing anything and this is no different. What I used to do before I got a router was I would just use a flush cut saw to take the two edges that are overlapping here, the excess from the top and the bottom, and then after that along the long grain I would plane it and along the short grain I would sand it. And that was a hard work way of doing it, especially if you're doing it in bulk. But now I've got the router table, I'm gonna give it a shot with a flush cut bit to see if that works. If it doesn't, I haven't lost anything. Be careful of tear out. Do the long grain first, because then you can cover any tear out with a chamfer on the side grain. And take it nice and slow. Don't try and take it all off in one pass if you're not comfortable. What we're left with now is six boxes, but it's not a box if you can't get inside. So next thing we're gonna have to do is chop the lids off. Don't cut it too close to the top that you've glued on here because otherwise wood movement won't be supported. As for how you cut them, that's up to you. If you have a table saw or a band saw, you're laughing right now because that is super easy. Pop it up on its edge and just run it through the band saw or run it through the table saw a couple of ways. Remember, if you're doing the table saw and you're cutting halfway through, support the bit that you've cut so it doesn't close up on the blade. Just a couple of wedges in there will sort that right out. So, let me show you how I'm gonna cut the lids off these. We're gonna use a Japanese flush cut saw. We're gonna use the rip cut edge because we're going along the grain, not across it. And we're going to put wood underneath the saw to the height of that line, which is give or take exactly a quarter mil plus a half mil piece of plywood. What we need to do is stick these to the back of the saw so that it's raised up. We're going to reference off the bench. Cleverly, we're going to set them back by the width of a piece of the scrap wood that we've got. Don't go all the way through. They're very close, but you're going to leave one mil left on there to support the cut all the way around. And then we do all four sides the same way. That method worked out perfectly. You can see the seams line up absolutely great. Missed the line by a bit, but that's okay. Two tips very quickly. Wax the bottom of the wood underneath your circular saw and have the least friction. This seems a little bit um, counterintuitive, having the bigger piece on the top because it might rock, but if you're careful, this is less friction, wax it up. Secondly, clear your workbench every time you've done a cut. Don't let all the sawdust get underneath the wood because it will raise the cut up and eventually you might go off that line. I split these boxes up. Mark them up so you know what goes with what. Just put a little V on it so you know which is the front and which is the back. And then pop it to one side. The best way that I know to clean these up is your hand plane. You could probably go about it if you glued sandpaper to a flat board and went about it that way, making sure that you're going across the angles in diagonals. Personally, I like to have the plane and I like to walk it around the edges. If you've got a block plane, and you prefer using that, go for it. Have a little look at the grain directions when you start, because tear out is just gonna mean you're gonna have harder work. Now, none of that time have I tried to get it absolutely perfectly flat. If you close the lid and the base back up, see the tight spots. 
So then what you want to do is just take your plane and level off some of the tight corners because eventually it will fit perfectly into place. Then once you're happy with the fit, do all the rest. You'll get better as you go along and it'll get quicker. Then we've got a box that you could decide what you want to do with. And I'll talk you through that when I catch you up. One thing I will say is this doesn't have to be a hinged box. From this stage onwards, you can put anything you want to keep this lid on. You could put magnets in each of the corners. You could put another layer of wood inside, slightly protruding so it sits flush on top of it. You can do what you want. I'm choosing to do hinges just because, do you know what? It drives me nuts and I hate hinges. Maybe we shouldn't have done hinges. Anyway, that's part of the design now. I've got these small hinges and I've got some small screws. And one of the priceless additions to any workshop, the center finding drill bit. I'm not sure that's exactly what it's called, but basically when you push it down into this, it will find you the center. There is a trick that will stop this happening. You see it's flush on one side, not on the other. That's purely because one of the hinges I've set is around about a millimeter out of whack. And I'm gonna show you a nifty little trick that's gonna help you get past that and make sure that your hinges never let you down. Seat the hinge and scribe around it. And then I've set my adjustable square to the half or just slightly under half of the total opening of the hinge. And that's so that I can scribe down the back and make sure that I don't go too deep. Follow the marking across so that you can see it on the back. And that's from the edge of your hinges. And then scribe along your square so that you have a depth line on there. And then do that for both hinges. The next thing we're gonna do is find our sharpest chisel and we're going to remove the stock. One thing to remember here is your first time putting the chisel in, don't go straight for the knife lines that you've made. Come in around about a millimeter because I guarantee you when you start hitting it with a mallet, it'll move across. And do the sides first, then the top. If you do the top first, it'll split further than the sides. You want the marks on the sides to hold the top in place. And then after that, we just remove from the end upwards, being very careful not to overshoot and make sure that it's down to the right depth. Clean it all out, make sure it's flat. Super, super simple. Okay, so here's the start of the bit that's going to save you a lot of grief down the line. First thing you wanna do is seat your first hinge and take your self-centering bit, drill out the first one. Pop a screw in. Pivot on this screw using the barrel for reference to make sure that it is as square as you can possibly get it. And then drill out another one. Second screw in, and these two are ready to reference off on your lid. Now normally what I would do here is I would put the lid next to the box and then I would just mark off one hinge onto the other. And that's the problem. When you start chiseling these out and you get them slightly off whack, you could have the lid sitting on a skewer. It's a bit of an extreme example. This is where we're just going to use a little bit of double-sided tape to help us with our job. Just pop it across the hinge, one on each. and then peel it off. It's worth popping a shim into the hinge to keep it flat. Anything that's a similar width to the gap, basically. Pop the lid flush on the front. Try not to press it down quite yet. Make sure it's exactly where you want it. Flush on the sides, flush on the front. And then activate the tape with pressure. Moment of truth, opening it. We're not gonna do anything but drill both holes on them. Any mistakes you make now, those holes will pull the hinges to exactly where you want them. And that's the trick. If it hasn't moved, you can mark these in, in position. Mark them, chisel them out, and then seat the hinges. 
That is as close to square as someone like me is ever going to get. Makes it so much simpler. If once you've got them closed, you're noticing a mill difference there or thereabouts, nothing big. Big ones, you've got to reset the hinges. But if you're noticing a very small difference where the top meets the base, this is where I just like to put them in my vise and very carefully, I like to just even it out and just take the overlap off. So at least at the front, forget the back, at least at the front, they will then be absolutely flush for anybody looking at it. It's really easy, just make sure you take your time. But once you've done all of this and you've got the boxes square, we can then set the inner pieces. For the dividers, we're gonna be using the same pine stock that we had to start with. And it should be the same width as the sides because that's what we made the sides out of. However, when we cut the box in half and planed it, we lost you know, approximately two or three mil. Not as much as if we use a circular saw, but what we need to do is make sure that when we're cutting these, we also take off two or three mil across the top. You don't have to watch me do it. What I'm gonna do is just hand plane them all down so that when they're glued inside, they don't hold the box open. What I didn't think you'd be interested in seeing is the sanding. Basically all of the smaller parts inside, I've given them a sand, I've rounded over the edges too. And they've all been cut to size. This one, for instance, will have the center piece sat in and then we'll have five dividing pieces across the front. One down. So with the internals in place now, the inside of this box is pretty much done. We haven't done a lot on the outside and that's what we're gonna address now. Now, this is really, as far as you want to take it, is the honest answer here. If you're planning on selling these though, one thing I would say is as personal as you can make them, the better. And also I'm gonna show you a way that's gonna give you flexibility so that if you're selling them and you have numerous ones of them, you can offer something that's a little bit different to every customer that you talk to. And I think that is going to be a really interesting selling point for you. The first thing we've got to do though is neaten up all these edges. They are a bit blocky for my liking. Now I'm gonna use my router for this because well, I've got it. I'm then gonna put a very small chamfer or a round over on the bottom. Could very easily just use a plane and chamfer as deep as you want into the sides. And then if you want to round them off with a sander, do it that way. I think this is the best and most important step and that's personalizing. What I like to do is just put a feature on here that will help it stay closed. Now, you could put it on the front, but it's gonna be off center and I don't like that. And I mean, that's the obvious choice. But what I'm gonna do is put something on the end here that's not only gonna keep it closed, but it's going to be an interesting and very good way of customizing it when you are selling the box. What this is, is just a little tab of wood that we are going to drill through the side of the top, through the tab of wood, and then we're gonna place an interesting little dowel feature through it to lock the box together. Then we have to drill through the outside box and the inside peg. That is your locking hole. So now you test it with one of your pins, make sure it goes through, and that, locks your box nicely and is a lovely feature. Now I said about offering people a choice and customization. I would make an alphabet and I would have all the popular letters and I would have at least three or four of some of the most popular ones um, because people's names. I'd have stars, hearts, Thor's hammer. Don't know why, thought that might be interesting and it's really simple. I'd make some out of dark wood, light wood. I've even done some out of the herringbone ply that I had left over from doing a project recently. These are the upsells you can do and these are the things that make these unique. And I'm gonna show you some finished products up next. I favor two different ways of finishing. First one is the simplest, easiest and quickest and that is just spray lacquer. Or I go for a hard wax oil, something like Osmo oil, where it takes a little bit longer because you have a longer curing time. But again, it is so easy to apply. Both of them tend to amber the wood a little bit, the lacquer a little bit more than the oil, and the lacquer will leave a sheen, whereas the oil tends to be, or the one I use, the Osmo oil, tends to be a little bit flatter. Now, 
for the fun bit. So I decided with my router and my plunge base and limited skill and no practice, I would just write out a name and then just route it out. Don't go too deep, you don't need to. And any sharp points that are left behind, just give them a little bit of a run over with the sandpaper. Whether you're offering these on Facebook Marketplace or Etsy, have a few examples because people can send you a name and you can route it on in, I think this took me about a minute and a half. And that is an extra fiver you could charge for it, my opinion. My wife does jewelry and I thought, I wonder if I could put her logo on this. So I gave that a shot. Now, I will say some of the smaller letters are a little bit trickier. So, so this one, I went for a long one at the back, thought that's quite good for necklaces, and then three at the front. This one, two off center, and then this way. This is just very cheap Amazon felt covered sponge. I'll leave a link to it in the description, and you just cut it to size with a craft knife, a scalpel, and then slide it in, wedge it in. I budgeted myself one box to do something a little bit quirky, and had a lot of fun. Doesn't look like much, but that was a heck of a lot of work. I think it looks really cool. I'm actually gonna do a video just for this though, because I think some of the techniques for a beginner are quite good fun. So hang fire for that. If you're gonna buy this wood in order to do this project, all 10 pieces of it in total came to 38 pounds. That's the entirety of the spend on wood. And that's what I had left over. I spent overall about £10 in hardware, take them to a craft fair, stick them online. Whatever amount you decide to put on them, I'm not going to suggest a price. Charge for the box, charge separately for the pegs, so you could do more intricate ones and try and tempt people in with a letter. Or maybe just do a plain round one as your stock and then charge a little bit extra for the fancy bits. But enjoy the build because if you're gonna be batching these out, have a little bit of fun with it. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope that there are beginner woodworkers watching this that realize that although you're learning, you can still sell what you make and it is still going to be wanted by someone out there. Use that money to equip yourself with the tools to bring your qualities up to the next level. If you don't have a router, for instance, to do the engraving, sell some plain boxes, get yourself a router and then upgrade what you offer for the next set. If you do get yourself a router with the money that you have decided to make from these, why don't you build a table to put it in? I guarantee it's going to make your life easier. The build's really easy too. Thanks for watching. I'll see you over there.